Jesus, I pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. You would fill me to say your words, to say them correctly, to say them in a way that you would want me to say them, to say the correct words, God, for your glory. And I pray that you would give everyone hearing the Holy Spirit and may that word be met with faith, which produces works in the heart of the hearers. God, I thank you, and uh, we understand that we cannot do this on our own. Man is of no help, but with God all things are possible. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I was driving yesterday to Ben and Margarita's wedding. Great for them. I'm driving, and you know, I turn on my little audiobook. It, it's a little a short drive from my apartment, so like Nugget Target area, and I'm passing where Safeway once used to be, and I feel like a, something kind of on my arm, like a little, you know, like my shirt moved or something, and I look over, and there's literally this huge spider. I swear it's like this big, and it's furry. You know, it's got these furry legs, and I just start going, <laughs> like meat grinder, you know, just, and, and literally there was a stain like this big on my, on my pants from the guts. It was disgusting. It was, it was horrifying because it, it, it had a body, and then it had this huge, like, inflated butt, too, you know, so it's, I just imagine like full of venom, you know, and th that was probably the scariest experience I had this year, Pro probably. I mean, I was just silently like just killing it, right? Uh, I turned off my audiobook and I just kind of drove in, in <laughs> with adrenaline, you know, um, and, and I just kept looking at my arm for like the next two hours to make sure I'm not going to die. But you realize that who here is just terrified of spiders? I mean, they're just disgusting. They're, and, and imagine like that big hairy one crawling on you, it just... Ugh, right? And yet sin, sin is so much worse than any spider in the world, literally. And Jesus says, it is better for you to lose your arm. It is better for you to lose your leg, to rip out your eye, than to have the full effect of sin in your life. You see, sin is the reason why so many people are unhappy. Sin is the reason why life is so hard. Anybody ever here have a, feel like you have a hard life? Honestly. Wow, you get it. I'm jealous. I'm really jealous. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm that spider in the meat grinder, you know? Just... So many people have lost hope because of sin. And it's the reason why this world is so miserable and sin, more importantly, is the reason why millions, if not billions of people will spend an eternity separated from God, away from God in hell. Sin. And that's why we're having this series called Hooked. Because when we ingest sin, that's exactly what happens. We just get hooked we get hooked, and, and, and all you know is how to pull back, and all it does is it just, it just drives it deeper into you, and you become a greater and greater slave to it. And what we want to do is we want to give you the tools when it comes to, be, when it comes to un, getting unhooked from sin. We want to give you hope through the gospel, and we want to educate you and inform you on what God has to say about sin, not what our natural intuitions and feelings might tell us about sin. So let's open up our Bibles. If you have your Bible, open it, and I don't care if it's on the screen. If you have a Bible, open it. It's for G James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. If it's on your phone, open it. I want you to get used to seeing scriptures with your own eyes, finding it, opening it up, reading it. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And when then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. Death is the end result of sin. I want to make, I want to have three takeaways from this passage tonight for us as we kick off this sermon series called Hooked. And the first one, we find it in verse 12. Let's read it one more time. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So James is describing a person, male, female, right, of who remains steadfast under trial. What that means is you withstand a temptation, you withstand a trial or difficult circumstances that you are facing. That's what remaining steadfast means. And when he has stood the test, or in other words, has passed the test, right? Remember, you know how when you take a test and you pass it? That's what he's talking about. So whoever has withstood the test, whoever has passed the test, who has gotten the A, B, or even a C, he will receive the crown of life. Now, what is this crown of life? Well, in, if you look back in times of Romans and the Greeks, what they would do is instead of a gold medal when you would win the Olympics, they would give you a crown, and it would be made out of different types of plants. Uh, and, and that was a way of, of recognizing the person. Now, you might say, well, I don't need a little crown made out of plants. I don't care about that. But what it was, it was a way of recognizing and saying, that is special. Who here wouldn't mind a, a gold medal from the Olympics? I mean, it's, I mean, it's a gold medal. You are forever recognized by the rest of the world for the history of the world. And what, what James is saying is, whoever passes the test will receive not just a gold Olympic medal, but he'll receive the crown or a medal, a recognition of life. And he's talking about eternal life. It's something that will last forever. This is, this is a crown that never fades. This is recognition that never gets old. So there is a reward to overcoming temptation, to standing the test. So those who stand the test, I want to make sure we have these equations straight. Those who stand the test are also those who receive the crown. Are you guys with me on that? Can, can I get a head nod? Those who stand the test are those who receive the crown. But also what we see is those, and, and then last part of verse 12, it says, which God has promised, that's the crown, he has promised it to those who love him. So those who receive the crown are also those to whom God has promised that crown to, and they also happen to be those who love God. So they are the, those who receive the crown are also those who love God. So those who stand the test receive the crown, and those who receive the crown love God. So if you put, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals what? C. And so what we see here is that those who withstand the test, those who pass, those who overcome temptation and remain steadfast and pure are also those who love God. And this, I think, is maybe the most important point of tonight's message, is that the only real way to withstand the test, to overcome temptation, the only way to win in the battle against sin is to love God. The love of God has to be central in our battle against sin. You see, the way the world fights sin, the way the world overcomes sin apart from God is by replacing one sin for another. Right? That's what we do. You always hear about the guy that smokes, drinks, does drugs, whatever, sleeps around, and then he finds that one girl that he wants to marry, and he quits everything. Right? We've all heard that story. Is, is he pleasing God? 
No, he's not. Because he just made an idol out of that girl. All he did was replace the sin of worshiping drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, whatever it is, sexual morality, for, to worshiping this girl who is also, that's still idolatry. Yes, she might be less physically destructive to his body than the drugs and the alcohol, but all he did was just swap one sin for another. Or, you know, we, we all know there's stories of people who might be unhealthy, they're overweight, and one day they decide, you know what, I'm done. I, I, I hate, you know, people looking at me like this, people laughing at me, the jokes, my self-esteem is just horrible. I'm going to get into shape. And they, get, they, get in, they actually get into shape. And, and legitimately, they become healthier. Did they overcome sin? No. All they did was swap the sin of gluttony, which is a serious sin in the Bible, with the sin of pride. The sin of saying, you know what, I'm not going to be like this, but I care what other people think about me more than what God thinks about me. And so when, when we're just swapping sin, that is not standing the test. That's just what the world does. The world does this all the time. That's why you hear people quitting drugs, and then there's no Jesus. It, it's not a miracle. It's just swapping one sin for another and some of you might say, well, Peter, don't be so overly religious and spiritual. If it works, it works. Great for that person. Hey, he lost a bunch of weight. He's healthy. Good. Why are you, why are you, you know, throwing shade at that? But the problem with this line of thinking is that it's centered around you. It's centered around me. If it works for me, it works for me. But do you realize that it is this type of thinking that has brought sin and brought misery and brought problems into the world to begin with. When God created Adam and Eve and he put them into the garden, right? He gave them everything and he said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One exception. It was all about him. He made the rules. We had to live by them and, and, and he was at the center. But the moment we said, no, no, I think I, think I got it, God. Y yeah, you have your opinion, but I think this is a better path. That is the moment we moved God from the center. Maybe not by a lot, but by enough to introduce sin. And through that slight moving formed a crack through which sin has entered into the world and into the lives of every single human being and has wrecked havoc for thousands of years. As soon as we move God from the center, as soon as we stop loving God, we stop fearing Him and obeying Him, sin comes in. So, yes, you can, you know, lose weight by motivating yourself out of vanity and pride. But in the end, you will still hurt yourself and damage yourself because it's still sin. It's like, it's like you know, steroids. People take steroids to be buff and to, and to compete, but we all know why steroids are illegal. The reason steroids are illegal is because they destroy your body after. And it's the same thing with doing things for the wrong reasons. Yeah, you might be healthy and in shape, but that pride will destroy your soul and ultimately it will lead you to be in hell. Truly overcoming sin, truly standing the test, needs to have God at the center. Guys, this is the main takeaway for tonight. It has to be God at the center, and it's only possible when you love God. Loving God needs to be the center, needs to be the, the epitome, the engine, the fuel, the everything that drives your battle against sin. And so often we are so focused on not sinning than on loving God, aren't we? Not sinning than not loving God. I want you all right now to not think of a black cat. Why'd you do it? You just all, don't, no, stop. Do not think about the black cat. What? What's so funny? 
Okay, all right, all right. Think of a big pink elephant. Think about, the, think about the big pink elephant. Now imagine this elephant, I mean, he's got tusks from, from here to the window, right? And he's huge, and he's fuzzy, too. Now, as you're thinking about this pink elephant, where did the black cat go? He disappeared. It was pushed out, right? Because you're now focusing. You're focusing on the pink elephant. We get whatever we focus on. I think you guys are understanding the analogy, right? Or y y anybody know, like, the secret to how to walk on, you know, walk on the edge like I'm doing right now without falling off? Watch, I'm going to fall off today. Do you know the secret to that? Is it to look down and say, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall? No. It's to look straight ahead at whatever you want to walk at and just walk. And you walk and you will keep your balance. But the moment you start saying, uh, uh, how am I supposed to keep my balance? That's when you start falling. That's what happened with Peter when he was walking on water. He was looking at Jesus, everything's fine and dandy. As soon as he starts looking at the waves and saying, wait, how am I doing this according to the laws of physics? And, he, and he's already drowning. It's the same thing with us in our struggle with sin. So often, we have a heart to kill the sin. We hate the sin. We're miserable because of the sin. We want to get rid of it. But all we're seeing is this sin and not seeing God. The reason why we even want to overcome the sin, if he is even the reason why we want to overcome that sin. Is love, is the love of God at the center of your battle with sin? Is the love of God the center of your struggle with whatever sin it is that you are struggling with? The amazing part is that when God is at the center, when he is sitting at the throne, when, when he is there, then everything else falls into place, just like the sun. When the sun is at the center of the solar system, all the planets fall into orbit. But as soon as the sun shifts, the orbit gets messed up. You see, when we love God, I want to give you examples. If you, if you have the love of God at the center of your struggle with sin, you can overcome your self-esteem issues. You can overcome your self-hatred and your self-loathing. And as you despise yourself and maybe the way that you look, you can overcome that when you have the love of God at the center. You realize, you know what, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter what people think about me or even what I think about myself because Jesus has loved me. Jesus has given himself up for me. And that, that, is, that is everything, Jesus. He has loved me. And I love him. And he has told me that I am precious in his eyes. So I don't care what you think about yourself, stupid self. Tell yourself that. Seriously. Or when it comes to sexual temptation. If you have the love of God at the center, you realize that, you know what, God loves you more than that. And God is, God is giving you something greater than just satisfying this physical urge and, and seek to find pleasure in God and, and to overcome your loneliness by having fellowship and love with Jesus. He is enough. He is enough. And you can overcome sexual temptation in your life while being single. There are plenty of guys and girls that have overcome and have put to death the sin of sexual temptation while being single because they focus on the love of God and put Him first. Or maybe it's anger. When you have the love of God at the center, you realize, man, God loves me. I love God or I want to love God. God loves that other person I'm so angry at. God has forgiven me so much more than this person has sinned against me. Man, how could you stay angry at a person when, when, you, when you realize and comprehend the love of God for you, for that person? And maybe there's anxiety. Maybe you're struggling with anxiety again. The, the solution, if you struggle with anxiety, is not, don't worry. 
That, that gives me anxiety just thinking about that, right? I mean, I come in and I hear that song, don't worry, be happy. Like, no, like I want to run out of Starbucks when I hear that. It doesn't work. But when you focus on the love of God, you realize that God loves you and you love God. And, and, and God said in his word that he takes care of the sparrows. He takes care of the little birds and not one of them perish without his knowledge. And we are far more precious than many sparrows in his eyes. How can you lay a firm grasp of that and still let the anxiety just eat you up. We can't. Because when we comprehend the love of God, which surpasses knowledge, it's a, it's a total game changer. So the first takeaway, the first point we see is that those who withstand the test, those who overcome temptation are those who receive the crown of life, and those who receive the crown of life are those who love God. Therefore, those who withstand the test are those who love God, and the love of God should be the center of all of our struggles with sin. Guys, again, if you're just focusing on how do I make things better, how do I make my life better, how do I, if God is not at the center, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. And you might be even making things worse by swapping one sin for another and thinking that you're good. That's even worse. Oh, I'm good. I solved my problem. No. You just swap one problem for another, and now you think you have no problem. Before, you knew you had a problem, but now you think you don't even have any problems, and that's the worst kind of problem to have. The second point. Let's read verse 13. First James, verse 13. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now, as I started thinking about this, has anybody ever thought about this phrase right here? I am being tempted by God. Has anyone ever heard anyone say that before? Can I get an honest raise of hand? This is an honest survey. Who here has heard someone say, I am being tempted by God? Okay, a few, right? Like God is tempting you. God is, you know, giving you sexual temptations. God, it just, I don't know. I haven't, I've never heard that. I've never heard someone genuinely say that and believe that. And I started thinking, I'm like, why? Why did, why did James put this in there? Is it because people used to say that back in the day? Like that was a thing, you know, and maybe that was a theological misconception that was now fixed by James writing this letter, and as I started reading and, and praying about it and I started reading commentaries, it dawned on me. It dawned on me. James isn't crazy talking about some crazy people. But here's what, here's what he's talking about. Let's go back to the garden, again, where it all began, sin. Do you remember when, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came and God said, Adam, what have you done? Do you remember what Adam said? Do you guys remember what he said? He said, the wife that you gave me, she gave me, she gave me the fruit and I just, I just took it. The wife that you gave me, the temptation that you placed into my life. This is, this is, this is mind-boggling. Because I realized that every time we do not take ownership of our own desires, and that's what James is saying, everyone is lured and enticed by his own desires. Every time we don't take ownership of our own desires and try to blame external circumstances outside of us, we are essentially doing exactly what Adam did there in the garden. Blaming God. Like if you were to sin right now and God would appear right in front of you and said, what have you just done? And you said, the, the, the billboard that you made me drive by or the person that you put me next to, I couldn't withstand not gossiping. It, you put me here. You're in charge. You planted the tree. You put the billboard there. You made that thing pop up on my phone. And so I just went and satisfied my desires. 
Every single time we do not take ownership of our sin and our own desires, we are essentially blaming God for our sin by blaming circumstances. And the problem is we have an ownership issue. If only I didn't drive by and see that billboard. If only that thing didn't pop up on my phone. If only I had some money, then I wouldn't need to steal or cheat. If only she didn't say that in front of me. If only he didn't tell me that and make me so angry at him. In the end, we are blaming God. We're blaming God. We're pulling an atom. And there's a few problems with this. The first problem is that we are falsely accusing God. We are falsely placing blame on him who is innocent. Anybody here ever been falsely accused of something? If you have siblings, you probably have, right? It's horrible. It's horrible. He didn't do anything wrong. And, and you get falsely accused. And, and even worse, you get falsely punished. But that's what we do. We falsely accuse God. You are the one who are in charge of circumstances. You're the almighty, all-sovereign, all-knowing, all-powerful. And you made me do this. If you're blaming your circumstances, you're blaming the one who controls your circumstances. If you're not taking ownership for your own desires, which are a response to your circumstances then you are falsely accusing the innocent. Second of all, the second problem with this line of thinking is that we are repaying evil for good. And you ever, besides being falsely accused, have you ever done something genuinely good for somebody and they just returned it with evil? Man, that's even worse. It's just, that, that is the heart of evil. And you think like, man, those people deserve to be in the, the deepest, darkest, hottest pit of hell. And yet all of us do this to God. Every single time, we blame God that I am being tempted by God. We are returning evil for the good because in verse 17, right after that in James chapter 1, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. Every single good thing you have in your life, the meal that you just last enjoyed, the breath that you are about to take in and enjoy, the, the, the water that you drank, the sleep that you got, the coffee that you drank, the family that you have, the friends, the awesome conversation and fellowship, the bonds that you have with people, all of those are good and perfect gifts coming down from the Father of lights. And instead of returning good for good, we return evil for good and saying, no, the wife that you gave me, she made me do this. It's your fault. And the third problem with this line of thinking is that when we blame external circumstances, when we blame God, we give up ownership. And by giving up ownership, we give up the ability to change. To change. Uh, because ownership, right, if you own something, that means you have rights over it. Uh, my phone, I own it. I could do whatever I want with it. I could smash it right here. I could gift it to one of you. I could sell it. I could, I don't know, leave it in the closet. I could do whatever I want with it. And you know what? You can't do that because you don't own that phone. It's the right to do something with it. I remember I was talking to an uh, older gentleman, and he was, uh, I was in his backyard, and he was complaining to me about this this tree that was growing in, in his neighbor's yard, which was like a, his adjacent backyard neighbor, and it was a tree, and it didn't just drop leaves, it dropped like this fluff, you know, this literally like this, I don't know how to explain it, like cotton or something across all the yards, and it was just this huge hassle, and it was just filthy and super difficult to clean up, and he's just complaining and complaining about it, right? And he's like, oh, I hate this tree and this and that. Well, why don't you go remove it? He can't. He can't because he doesn't own it. You could have the chainsaw. You could have everything you need, all the tools. You could have all the power. 
could have a tank, a bulldozer, whatever it takes. But if you don't own it, then you don't have the right to change or do something about it. And this is often the problem is we already have the power, especially the power given to us by God through the Holy Spirit. But when we do not take ownership of our own desires and our own sins, we forfeit our right to do something about it, to change something about it. The worst thing that you can do with your sin is to make up excuses. The worst thing you can do with your sin and about your sin is to make up excuses. If only I wasn't introduced to pornography when I was so young. If only this or this or that. Or if only my family situation wasn't like that. If only I didn't have this experience, then I would be different. The more you play the victim, the less you are able to change the less you're able to use the power that God gives us to change, to use that chainsaw, to use that bulldozer, to remove that tree once and for all. So the first step to begin overcoming sin is we, we need to take ownership. We need to stop making excuses. Instead of saying, oh, if only that thing didn't pop up on my phone, you need to say, no, no. I chose to keep thinking about what popped up on my phone after I had turned it off. Or as that, that first second passed, as after that first glance, I chose, and it might, be, it might have even been a tiny little choice, but I chose to keep looking at it instead of looking away. I chose to keep rewinding her words in my mind over and over and over again. I chose to not forgive him. No, I chose to consider other people's opinions of me as more important than the opinion of God. The first point, those who overcome sin are those who love God. The second point is that every time we blame our external circumstances, every time we make excuses, we are blaming God. We're, we're, we're falsely accusing the innocent. We are returning evil for good, and we are re relinquishing control and, and the right to change something in our life about our sin, even though God has already provided to us all the power of God in the form of the Holy Spirit to us if you are a believer. You can have a tractor and not use it to remove the thing that's polluting your yard and your house. If you tell yourself that you have no right to do that by making excuses. And lastly, James says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Notice the elements here. Notice what's happening here. We have a person. That's us. It's me. It's you. And this person is being tempted when, when, when he is being lured or enticed, like pulled away and drawn by his own desire. So there's a desire. There is a person. And, and the desire is doing something to this person it's, it's tempting them as they're luring and enticing that person away. There's three elements here. There's the desire, there's the verb, and then there's the person. And notice this. Notice that James creates a distinction between you, the person, and your desires. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about the fact that you are not your own desires. You are not your desires. Those feelings that you have, that's not you. That is not you. You are a soul, and you have desires, and you should take ownership for those desires, but you are not those desires.
And you don't need to follow them if they are bad. You don't need to follow them. You don't need to act upon them. You see, we as human beings, we're such interesting creatures. We always assume the best about ourselves, don't we? Like, come on, let's be honest. We just, we, we're, you know, I'm a great guy. I'm a great girl. Like, like you will never say it that way, ever, but you feel like that. You're a generally good person. Yeah, you might have some flaws, some vices, some bad things about yourself, but you know what? You're not that bad of a person. I'm a, I'm a pretty good person, right? It is just so interesting. And the people that we truly care about and the people that we love and that we believe that they are good people, don't we? Like, think about the people you love. Do you believe that they are bad people to the core? No. You believe they might make mistakes, they might need to improve things in their life, but they're generally good people, right? If you truly love a person, you believe that they're genuinely a good person, even if it's really, 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 really deep down inside where you can't see it. So what makes us like people? You guys, you guys ever notice that? Like in a crowd, you start walking and talking to people. What makes you like a person? What's the first thing that makes you like a person? Potential. Potential. Okay, that's temporary. What makes you like a person? Like just another human, as a human being. Anybody want to shout it out? Similarities. Similarities with whom? With yourself. Not similarities with somebody else. It's we like people when they're like us. Hey, we have so many things in common. You must be a good person too. I mean, like, I know that sounds simple and stupid, but that's really what, that's what essentially goes on in our heads. Hey, dude, man, that, that guy's great. He's, oh, man, he's got so many things in common. We're like almost best friends. It's like, I feel like I've known you for such a long time. Why? Because you've known yourself forever, and this person's so similar to you. You see, we have this tendency, very peculiar tendency, to apply this blanket of positivity towards ourselves and our world. We, we, uh, let me put it this way. It's, it's a blanket of positive predisposition towards ourselves and everything related to us, right? Can I get a head nod? We have a blanket, literally a blanket of positive predisposition towards everything like us and everything about us and our world. We're just like that. We all secretly think we're good even though sometimes we have mistakes and we do bad things, but generally we're, we're pretty good people, and that's the way we operate. But here's where the problem comes in. The problem is that when, when, when you get a desire, when a desire wells up in your heart, it welled up in your heart, not somebody else's heart. And you know what happens? Enter the blanket of positive predisposition just gets wrapped in that little blanket. Hey, it's my desire. I want to be true to myself. You guys heard that before? I want to be true to myself. This is my desire. I need to follow it. This is good. This is what I want. This, I must follow my desire because it's my desire. And it's crazy because most people don't ever question their desires because of this blanket of positive predisposition towards everything about them, everything about us. Let's not use the word them, but everything about us. And, and so logically, if a desire is good, then we must act upon it, right? Because we, we're good people. We like to act upon good things and good desires. And so we follow that. But the reality, guys, the reality is that you are not even your thoughts. Do you think about that before? 
You are not your thoughts. You know how they say, no, don't believe everything you see on TV or don't believe everything you read on the internet. Well, I want to say this, don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. And we all, we've, we've all had situations where we thought something and we acted upon it and then we were wrong. Anybody ever have that besides me? Okay. So don't believe everything that you think and don't believe everything that you feel. Just because you thought it, just because you felt it, doesn't mean it's automatically good. We need to create a disassociation between us and our desires. You are not your desires, your hopes, your dreams, your feelings, your thoughts. You are a soul made by God who has desires, hopes, dreams, thoughts, feelings, and they, those thoughts, dreams, hopes, feelings are responses to the external world around you. And they may or may not be good. They may or may not be good. And you need to determine which are good and which are not good. And pursue the good and leave behind and forsake that which is not good. You know, when we grow up, as you're growing up as a kid and you feel your hand burning, what do you do? Do you smell it? No. No, you don't do that. You just, you get your hand out of the fire. That's your, you know, you get this burning sensation, and you just act on your desire right away. And we grow up acting on our desires, and so many of the desires are good because they're preserving us because if we didn't have them and we didn't act upon them, we just sat there and analyzed it like, Hmm, it's an interesting sensation I'm having. What, is it, what does it really mean from a philosophical perspective? Like, if you did that, you wouldn't have a hand. But the problem is that we, we, we act upon it instinctively, and, and we do that with the rest of our desires that come our way, whether they're sinful or not. And we begin to believe that our desires are us. And this is where we have the identity issue. We believe that our desires are us. Again, guys, think about this. You are not your desires. James creates a very clear distinction between our desires and us. And often, maybe not often, but there's a certain type of desires that are out to destroy you. Do you realize that you have something sitting inside of you right now that wants to kill you? Do you realize that? It's literally something inside of you that wants to kill you. It's not a spider that's sitting on your hand. It's something sitting inside of you conspiring against you and your soul. It's called sin. It is Satan's tool. It is his implant into your mind to destroy you, to destroy you. Because he hates people. He hates people with the most utter hatred, darkest evil hatred ever. And he's got something inside all of us. And it appears so beautiful. And yet inside the bait is a hook. Which is meant to destroy us, which is meant to kill us. That is the purpose the purpose of the bait on the hook is not to feed fish. The purpose of your sinful desires are not to bring you pleasure, even though they might, even though that piece of food does give that fish a certain amount of satisfaction until the hook gets revealed. And then when we get the fish, we cut it open, we take the bait out, we throw it on the hook, next fish. And that's what Satan does to all of us. You don't even have time to digest that desire and that pleasure when he, he, he fulfilled his purpose, he leaves you empty, takes it out, and goes after his next target. Your sinful desires are meant to deceive you. 
They are meant to destroy you. There is an intentional purpose and thought-out purpose behind those desires. Just because I want to do something is not a good enough reason to do it. You know, I've asked people before, like, why are you doing this? Why are you, like, you know, you know this is not right. Why are you doing this? And the answer is, I don't know. I just want to. I just want to. Has anyone ever said that before? I've said that before. I just, I just want to. You know what that is? That, that means the person knows the truth, but they don't want to think about it. That also means that you're basically saying, you know what, no, I'm good. I'm good, and anything I want is inherently good. So if I want it, it must be good, and I should act upon it. That's what we say when we say, I just, I don't know, I just want to. I feel like it. That might be a good enough reason to blind your eyes and to help you take a bite of that bait. But in the end, you'll be hooked. And it's totally not in line with God's truth about us because God's truth about us says that all have fallen short. Everybody. And we have fallen and wicked and corrupt, destructive desires in our heart, whether they are physically destructive or spiritually destructive. So guys, learn to disassociate yourself from your desires, from the things that you crave. I know it might feel natural. I know it might feel good, but it's meant to destroy you. When my wife and I were engaged, there was a lot of temptation. There was a lot of sexual temptation. I'm like, man, we're going to be married in a couple of months. And it feels so natural. And what's going to be the difference in the next couple of months? It feels so good. Why not? We have it. It's natural. It feels natural. It doesn't matter because it's Satan's way of killing us. And there's so many stories of just the same thing over and over again. People fall into sin and guilt and shame and, and just this vicious cycle. Vicious cycle. It doesn't matter how natural something feels. Again, we are intentionally being deceived. And we're not going to be, you know... When you make a fake dollar bill, you don't make it obviously fake. You try to make it seem as natural and good and perfect and pleasant as possible. And Satan has been perfecting the art of deception for thousands of years. We need to learn how to disassociate from our thoughts, from our feelings, from everything, really. And be able to analyze and with wisdom to discern, is this good or is this not good? To discern by the wisdom of God. So in conclusion, one, we've seen that the key to overcoming sin is loving God, the love of God. That has to be the center. So often we're so focused on defeating our sin that we lose sight of the one, why we do all of this. I forgot my second point. Two, when we do not take ownership for our sin, when we do not take ownership for our desires, we remove our right and we remove our ability to even overcome that sin, even though God may have already given us that power in the form of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. When we make excuses, we can't change. And we falsely accuse God and we turn evil for good, the Father of lights, from whom are all perfect gifts. And lastly, we are not our own desires. Learn to think them through and to analyze them and to see what God has to say about our desires. I just want to end with this. James is writing to believers. He says in verse 2, my brothers, my brothers and sisters, my family, to so those who have believed in Christ, James is equipping believers to overcome sin and to overcome temptations. 
But you realize that if you don't have Christ, if you have not come to Christ, if you have not repented, if you have not been forgiven of your sins, if you have not confessed it to God, it doesn't matter if you stop sinning today. Like, even if you, as an unbeliever, were to figure out a way to stop sinning completely today, that's great. But you have already reserved a seat for yourself in hell through what you've done in the past. You've got special seating in there. It, it's waiting for you. Because you have already done wrong. A sin against the infinite one deserves an equal reaction of infinite punishment. And God doesn't delight in that. And that's why God sent his son Jesus to say, I'm going to send my infinite son my eternal son, to take that infinite punishment upon him and to destroy it and let you walk away free, let you walk away clear once and for all, past, present, future. That is how much God has loved you and that is how much God does not want you to receive what you so rightly deserve, what I so rightly deserve and have earned with my own deeds, with my own good self. Sin cannot be swept under the rug. Payment has to be made. Justice has to be served. And the only way that you can walk away without paying that price yourself is to trust in Jesus. That's the only way, guys. If you are trapped in sin, if you are just, if you're just like this, this, I don't know, I don't know, like I imagine this little animal that just walks into a trap and is just tied up and is just sitting there and it's, it's trying to rip its way out, but it can't because the trap that was designed was designed by somebody a million times smarter than that little animal. And, and it's only a matter of time until the hunter comes back to just kill it, skin it, eat it, whatever. If you're, if you're that and you're hooked and you're stuck in that sin, call out to him who is greater than the hunter. Call out to him who is greater than the one who hates your soul and has implanted this sin into your heart and is using it to destroy you. Because there is freedom in Christ. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And in another passage, he says, I am the truth. You shall know Jesus, and he, the mighty warrior, he, the, the great king, ruler, president, whatever you want to call it, he is mighty to save, to come in and destroy your sin. And the one who hates you and is trying to destroy you. He is so good. He is so wise. He is so loving. He is so noble. And he went in and, and, and laid his life down. He put himself into that trap. And he was slaughtered so that we wouldn't have to be. Let's stand and pray. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for your word. I thank you for Apostle James, for just enlightening us, for opening up our eyes, for showing us the nature of our hearts and the nature of sin and the nature of God. And God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word right now and just listening to us saying, man, this is good, this is good, this is good, I need to do this. But Lord, that we would be doers of the word. I pray that you would give us that real, genuine faith that produces those good works, God. And I pray for those who are so caught in sin right now and, and they, don't, they don't even know if they can get out. They might not even know it. They don't know you. They don't know anything. God, I pray that you would save them and shine your light into their souls, Lord, and that they would be free. They would know who you are because the center of defeating sin is not us being strong or us getting better. It's you, God. It is the love of God. I pray that everyone here would love you, God. I pray that I would love you. We thank you and we pray this all in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.